Thorn Academy football is 100 years proud, dating back to 1893. As we celebrate the centennial, we look back at a century of memories that have taken place on the gridiron. The 1993 team breaks through the centennial banner to celebrate 100 years of TA football. It all started in the fall of 1893. Averaging 142 pounds a player, the first Thornton Academy team took the field, and the legend began. Eight games later, they were the York County champions, having defeated every team in York County and outscoring local teams 88 to four. What follows in this video are highlights of 100 glorious years of Thornton Academy football. The first decade of TA football started the tradition of great TA teams. From 1896 to 1898, Thornton's football team was undefeated and claimed the state championship all three years. TA's gridiron record was 19 wins, no losses, and three ties, scoring 384 points, allowing only 18. Local praise and adoration of the TA team also became an early tradition. For example, the 1897 team's outstanding season was rewarded by a night at the opera on Thanksgiving evening and a free meal at Mr. Ricker's restaurant in Biddeford. A standout player during those three seasons, Walter Bradford, still ranks in the top 20 list of all time Thornton Academy scorers. The Biddeford Thornton rivalry appeared early in TA football history. An estimated 600 people paid to watch the second Biddeford game that year, which ended quite abruptly with TA on top four to nothing when the umpire disqualified a bit of a player for slugging. As the tripod reported, this brought forth the usual bit of a howl and they refused to play. The academy boys lined up time after time and waited for Biddeford to do the same. The referee declared that if the Biddeford team did not line up, it would be Sacco's game. The Biddeford team refused to play and so the forfeit win went to TA. This first season ending would result in T.A. and Biddeford not playing again until 1901. In the 1900s, the glory years were 1904 and 1908. Only one team managed to beat Thornton in 1904, the University of New Hampshire's second team. Even then, the college team managed to score only one touchdown against the younger Thornton 11. In 1908, the team tallied a 6-1 record against local main teams outscoring opponents three to one. Carl Dennett, who remains on TA record books in the top 50 all-time scorers, scored one-third of the team's 92 points. There were three years during this decade when no TA football team took the field, representing the only footballless gaps in TA's 100 years of football. These years were 1900, 1906, and 1907. The student tripod editor mourned the absence, writing, the athlete of Thornton this year will never be able to call about him his children and take upon his knees his grandchildren and tell them of the prowess of old Thornton. Certainly we have fallen upon sad times. Thornton was an unstoppable powerhouse on the football field during the 1910s, winning 80% of its games. 56 of their 66 wins were shutouts. And Thornton teams didn't just shut out opponents, they clobbered them. In 1918, T.A. trampled Deering 99 to nothing and steamrolled Portsmouth High 119 to nothing. Overall, T.A. outscored opponents 2,076 to 248 during this decade. Five of Thornton's top 15 all-time scores played during this decade. All in all, the school's football prowess earned seven titles over the decade. The 1914 squad was the highest scoring team of that time, averaging 33.7 points a game. Two of TA's all-time top five scorers were on the field together this year. Clyde Jack Stewart, class of 15, and Leslie Hansen, class of 16. Hansen scored 92 points in this one season alone. Every win during the eight one and one season was a shutout. Fans grew bored with these one-sided affairs. A student wrote after one of TA's trouncing, it was a slow and rather uninteresting game. The 1916 team racked up a 7-1-1 record, playing schools from across New England. The defense held their opponents to three points. The offense scored 230 points. It seemed to be merely a case of too much pep on the part of our boys 
the tripod reported, after a 52 to nothing rout of Newburyport High School. The 1918 team continued to rack up the points, scoring 308 points against their opponents, 34 points. Carlton Lamb, class of 19, led the effort, landing a spot today in the top 10 all-time scores. His teammate Lester O'Rourke still remains in the top 20. The 1919 season was not an incredibly high scoring season, but with the defense holding opponents to an average of 4.3 points a game, TA again dominated and tallied a 6-1 record. The career of college All-American Hillary Mahaney started in this decade. He still remains in the top 15 on TA's all-time scorer list. The 23 and 24 TA football teams represented two of the great teams in the school's history, losing only once to an in-state team and reeling off 13 consecutive wins. After dropping the first game of the 23 campaign to Deering, by lack of teamwork and the fact that we had not struck our pace, as the tripod reported, TA's 11 found its stride and knocked off the remaining eight teams on its schedule. With Ted Brownlee, Buck Hammond, and Kid LaValle in the backfield, and a stonewall line, they swept everything before them, a student wrote of TA's 1924 team. The only team not scored on in Maine during the entire season. The team is determined that they shall concede to nothing but victory, and these students must feel the same way, nothing but victory, another student wrote in the tripod. While the 1924 team brought the state title to TA, Two other teams during this decade were also strong. The 27 team, with an 8-0-2 season, finished second in the Southwestern Football Conference. Only South Portland got the best of TA during the 1928 season. David Brownlee led the scoring with 48 points for the season. Once again, TA finished second in the Southwestern Conference. TA dominated the Southwestern Conference during the 1930s with five undefeated seasons and a state championship. Coaches Bob Bowie and George Martin led TA's teams during nine stellar seasons. A team that always had the punch and drive at the deciding moment describes the 1931 team. The team filled the bleachers with fans as they went 8-0-1 with five of their wins by a margin of a touchdown. TA continued its winning ways and went undefeated for the second straight season in 1932 under coach Bob Bowie and captain Wendell Sawyer. TA shut out three teams and outscored opponents 163 to 31. After two straight undefeated seasons, the 1933 team went 7-2-0, although five of its wins were shutouts. TA was back to unbeatable form in 1934. In fact, opponents managed only one touchdown all season. Burton Mitchell led the team scoring with 14 touchdowns. George Martin ably took over the head coaching reins from Bob Bowie as the 1935 team went 8-1-0, allowing only two touchdowns to be scored against them. George Martin's maroon typhoon blew through another season in 1936, winning all nine games. A Biddeford Journal photograph in December 1936 proclaimed them the 1936 state champs. The scorebook from 1937 shows that the team was consistent and powerful. TA won six, lost none, tied three. The ball carrying ability of Anderson and Terry Touchdown McSweeney stood out. The 1938 team was a scoring machine. TA averaged 31 points a game. Captain Anderson led the way with 15 touchdowns. He was assisted in the scoring blitz by Carl Goodchild and Tuffy Fatanities. The Maroon defense shut down their opponents who averaged a measly four points a game. With only three returning veterans in 1939, George Martin had his coaching job cut out for him. Martin put together not only a winning team, but a conference winning team. TA rolled over its opponents, shutting out four of its first five opponents on the way to a 9-1-1 record. George Lester and Paternities regularly crossed the goal line during this 232-point season with scoring help from Brownlee. Football at Thornton in the 1940s had its ups and downs. In the first three seasons under coach George Martin, T.A. won 
PA went 23-4-1, outscoring opponents 569-91 and claiming at least a share of two conference titles. But the 40s was also the decade during which TA had its second ever winless season and lost many key players to the war. The 1940 football team clinched the conference title in an 8-2-1 season that included six shutouts. TA amassed four times as many points as their opponents, in part because three of TA's top 30 scorers were on the field that year, George Lester, John McSweeney, and Albert Emery. Only one team out of 10 scored on a Thornton machine in 1941. George Martin's Maroon scored 220 points to a measly 12 points by opponents. This 1942 team went six and one, with four shutouts to its credit, and probably would have gone into conference title except for the fact the Southwestern Conference disbanded after the 1941 season. Thorne's longest reign as one of the top football teams in the state came during the tenure of coach George Martin, 1935 to 1943. In Martin's nine years, TA won 70 games, lost only nine, and tied seven. TA racked up 1,884 points nearly six times as many points as their opponents, 316. Martin, with the help of his lucky hat, led TA to defeat Bedford eight times with one tie, outscoring the rival team 198 to 12 in nine games. Thornton's fabulous football 50s will long be remembered for the last quarter drives that paid off, the records that were broken, and the back-to-back -back state championships of 1954 and 1955. It was a decade that boasted many a Maroon All-Stater, two All-Americans, two top 10 all-time TA scorers, and another 16 plays who remain in the top 100. There were exciting cliffhangers, particularly 1957 and 1958, with one-point games and innumerable contests where the margin of victory was a touchdown or less. Head coaches Eck and Pavlikowski steered the Maroon through most of this decade. I was fortunate enough to begin at Thorn in 1953, and I have, except for five years, been at the school in one capacity or another. And of course, I hope you realize that in 53 I was a player. And then, of course, uh, uh, after graduating from college, I came back as, as a coach and then as a, a, an athletic administrator. And this also afforded me an opportunity to witness and be a part of uh, selecting probably some of the best coaches that uh, Thornton has had the privilege of having as coaches, namely Bob Cody and Dick Agresti. It might be interesting for some people to go back and into the period of time that I played. We were very fortunate even then uh, to have, without a doubt, uh, best coach in the state of Maine. Uh, this gentleman's name was uh, Tommy Eck. Tommy really ev uh, evolutionized football here in the state of Maine because he was the first coach coming into a system uh, in which he was a completely dedicated, organized, and filmed every game, which was never heard of at that time. And he was also very fortunate to have a, a run of really good athletes. And uh, he was a head football coach at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, and for whatever reasons got him to Thornton, uh, he was at Thornton. And his success was, was really unbelievable. Uh, up until Biddeford's series, uh, I think it was like two or three years ago, we had the longest string of victories during that period of time. Uh, again, it was a combination of athletes and, and a combination of uh, outstanding coaches. My playing at Thornton Academy, I go back to the years of 54, 55, and 56. Uh, those were historic years. Uh, we'd won 24 consecutive games during that period of time. Um, and rel with relative ease, uh, except I'd, I'd say my sophomore year, we, we had tough football games with St. Louis over at Thornton. Uh, I think it was 19 to 14. It was a very rugged and physical ball game. And we had a physical game with South Portland. The other seven, uh, the other eight were, were, were quite, were, were blowouts almost. And, uh, we won the uh, scoring title that year. We scored some awesome number of points. Um, so it was, what I'd learned my sophomore year was that we were part of a very successful uh, organization. Tom Eck was the head football coach. He was 
Uh, he was very professional. He came from the University of Massachusetts, two thought in the academy to become our coach. And uh, obviously has, has one of the finest records in New England. My junior, uh, uh, we played, uh, again, ten football games and uh, uh, nine football games. We won all nine of those. And the one game we thought we were going to have to be up for was South Portland. Uh, we played them out at the academy and we were able to defeat them, I think, 38 to 6. So what I remember about our, our, our football games and our football teams and the, and the wonderful people that played on them, uh, the Roger Spaldings, the uh, uh, Brad Leaches, Norm Lombards, Gil Patrick, Stack Pulls, Ron Boutet, Ralph Tarbox, to, to name just a few. Uh, was it, we, were, we had a rather professional attitude about it. Uh, we know what, uh, that after the game was over, we began to worry about the films, because in, in our day, every single play was evaluated by the coaches. And you went in there with a rank sheet, knowing exactly how you performed. And if you didn't do well, I mean, you heard about it. And then, uh, more so than the games, we worried about practice, particularly what we call Bloody Wednesday, whereas we had full contact scrimmage which was more difficult than the game that we were going to play. Um, my junior, the most memorable game, would be the last one. It was against Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, we had to come from behind to beat them. And uh, the streak almost came to an end that day. Uh, my senior, it, 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 it did come to an end. We uh, were defeated by uh, Edward Little uh, at Thornton Academy. And that was the end of the streak. It's since been broken by, by that rather well-known figure in the area, Michael Landry from from Biddeford High School and his Biddeford High School Tigers. Uh, and then I would say the last memory I had of Thornton would be, would be as a coach. Uh, coaching for Thornton Academy in 62, Brad Leach was the head coach, and St. Louis came to town uh, undefeated. We were undefeated, and uh, we came away victorious, and uh, it was, a, it was a, that's a wonderful memory. Yeah, it was the wonderful kids, the, uh, David and Dennis McNabb, and the Sawyer boy, David, um, uh, Stevie Staples, uh, they're just a host of them. Uh, they're all wonderful people, good students, and an exceptional football team. Tommy Johnson, uh, Bobby Francis, uh, and the like. Hate start naming people uh, because you forget them. So uh, I, I'm very happy, very proud to be to have been part of a rich uh, football tradition here at the academy. But most of all, I think of a one-point loss my junior year to Edward Little, and then we went through the rest of the season undefeated. Uh, that every little game was a little special because I went 80 yards on a play from scrimmage and then 60, 70 yards on a, on a punt return, both called back. Uh, and then after that, it, the season went relatively well. Uh, then my s senior year, we lost, one, actually we lost to South Portland by one point, tied Portland. Uh, again, we tied, uh, uh, not really quite sure, but we had the, the total of one point, three games, we could have been undefeated totally. Now, excuse me, that including the other little game my uh, junior year. Then the memorable game was uh, absolutely playing against St. Louis. Jim Black was our captain at the time, our quarterback, Dan Donovan. He went on to Furman, I believe. Uh, we had some real, uh, Bob Kuchar, real fine in, uh, mostly a junior, junior line. Uh, Good ball players, but we were playing against the likes of Guy Garan, Al Daigle, uh, Danny Perro, uh, the 70 boy. Great players, great guys also. Uh, but that particular game, they were favored by at least two touchdowns. We're going in with the two ties and a loss. Uh, we're still, we could put 33 points up on the board, we could score. Our defense was suspect. However, we figured if we could hold them to three touchdowns, we'd probably win. That particular day, they went ahead immediately, seven to nothing. Uh, then I believe they were up at 13 to nothing. Then we went and we scored, we scored again. And four minutes left, re left remaining, we were 20 to 20. Onside kick, I received the football, I got the football. We get down and we score, four minutes left to go. Uh, they have fourth and 20. We have pass interference on the 20 yard line. Then they brought the ball to the point of infraction. From there, they were fourth and six with a minute and 20 seconds left to go. And they threw an onside pass and completed. Uh, score 26 26, or yeah, I could be a little wrong on that. Uh, they kicked the extra point. We lose by one, one point. Uh, 
we loved that game because we loved those those characters over there. They were all good guys. We got along very well. And after all was said and done, playing St. Louis and Thorn, it was part of your life. Every every could, every child should have that experience that plays football, as Jay had mentioned. Uh, the last couple of years, we've had some barn burners at Vaughn. Uh, those will be memorable. Uh, things that uh, plays that we'll never forget. In 1962, Brad Leach, class of 56, took over the head coaching reins at Thornton and immediately racked up a flawless season, capped with a state championship. The 1962 team, led by captains Dave and Dennis McNabb, scored 216 points and only allowed 34 during the 9-0 season. The opposition found the TA defense too tough to penetrate and its powerful offense too explosive to stop, a student wrote about this team. With 16 senior starters on a 1962 team, the following years were rebuilding years. In fact, the overall record for the decade shows as many losses as there were wins. Nine plays from the 60s are on the top 100 all-time TA scorers list, and four players from the decade did make the All-State first team. While the 1968 team managed a 7-2 record, it would not be until 1974 that a TA team would make it to the state championship game and not until 1986 before T.A. would again be the best in the state. In 1962, I took over for Bill Pawlikowski, and Bill Pawlikowski left a horde of athletes that I forever wished I had for a number of years after 1962. That year, we were undefeated and obviously declared state champions. And it was a rather interesting season because uh, our final game culminated with uh, playing St. Louis, and St. Louis was a parochial school in Bedford that was a very successful uh, school, obviously under the tutelage of Bob Cody. And it came down to that final game, and we were both undefeated, and people were hanging from trees, and I literally mean they were hanging from trees. We played at Thornton Academy. Uh, we moved all the bleachers from, uh, I shouldn't say all, but a uh, major part of the bleachers from St. Louis Field over into the end zones of that old field. And I, I will guarantee you that uh, uh, there was not a seat, nor was there any standing room, uh, you know, five people deep. It was also interesting because there was a great deal of frustration in that last game. Uh, in 1962 because there was a postponement that Saturday. It was raining so hard that, you know, how as a player you really want to get the, th you've prepared yourself mentally and you want to play the game, uh, you don't care if it's raining or not. But it just would have been an injustice to the whole scenario to, to play it, so the decision was made uh, to postpone the game until Monday, and we did that and it was a beautiful day, and uh, the final score was 13-7. Uh, to 7. Uh, Again, I was blessed with a, a number of good athletes, of which I, I'll name a few, but I've obviously, uh, through the years have, and, and time, I, we're going to miss a few, but we had the McNabb twins, uh, Dennis and David. Uh, Dennis was a quarterback, and he, just outstanding athletes. Bobby Kimball, we had John Soucy, we had a number of, you know, of, of players there, Paul Carter, Bob Francis, and, and uh, these kids at that time were, were the epitome of football players and athletes. But they're a different athlete than the athletes that we have now. Uh, yes, we had a weight program and so forth, but not to the extent they have now. Athletes today are, are, are so much better uh, prepared. They're, uh, physically, they're much better. Uh, that's not to say that their natural skills are any better, but they have the opportunity to refine them a lot better than what they did in those generations. But that was a great team. Uh, again, we continued undefeated. And I, I really think that if I could have stopped my career there, I would have uh, just been a happy man forever. Uh, obviously, uh, after winning one state championship, your goal is to win another one. And we proceeded through the years to attempt that, uh, not really being successful until 1968. And in 68, I thought was probably the best team that I had coached or ever seen around. Uh, we had an athlete on that team that was probably far superior to any athlete that 
has come down the line that I know of, uh, a boy named David Lane. Uh, David had every attribute, including intelligence, of, of being an outstanding uh, football player. Uh, the first, he went to Colby, and the first two games he played at Colby after he graduated from Thornton, he was the ECAC player of the week. So it just goes to show you that he's just fantastic. He was very small, not, not, a big, not a big man, but he had such deceptive moves and had such change of speed capabilities and intelligence and, I mean, he, he was just a fantastic athlete. And there were a lot of good athletes through this decade of time uh, that we had, but that team had a few of them. Barry DeRocher, who was very local, probably, uh, if, if I were going to categorize uh, a player for toughness, quickness, uh, determination, and, and a winner, Barry would epitomize it. Uh, you, you just found that after watching the films, uh, we put Barry in a down position that after the first quarter, uh, the guy across the line was trying to avoid him. And, and that just makes for, for an offense to cave in. And, and those types of players have existed uh, in all of those years. But you have to have chemistry, you have to have numbers uh, for this to be and to reach this championship. And again, we lost one game uh, that year at Bangor, 21 to 19, and it was a dreadfully hot day. And I think yeah, this is where not having trainers and experience and, and so forth, uh, I think I contributed, to, contributed a great deal to, to us not winning by restricting the amount of water. I mean, it's a simple thing now, but at that time it was saying, well, don't give them too much water, they'll get, the, you know, it was things like that 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 really have changed. And you have trainers on the field, you have doctors on the field. We didn't have that. So I've seen this whole evolution uh, as, a, as a player, as a coach, and as an athletic director. And uh, it's, it's been great. And, and fortunately for me, it's been at Thornton Academy. The 70s team compiled a record of 56, 36, and six which gives little indication of some standout performances that occurred, especially from 1972 to 1974. Thirteen players from the 70s still remain on the list of top 100 TA scorers. Two players made it to the All-American team, and 15 players made first team All-State. The 1974 team was particularly impressive. Led by coach Robert Cody, this team made it farther than any team since 1962 making it to the state playoff game. Despite its impressive 9-1-1 record, the Trojans had a difficult season, as one student wrote in the student newspaper. The games were enough to give you a heart attack. We often came into the locker room at halftime losing, but pull the games off. TA fans are known throughout the state to support their teams through everything, and they did no less than that in 1974. A thousand fans greeted the Trojans upon their return to Saco after losing the state championship game to Waterville. In that ball game, we got, we got beat in Waterville. We got ahead in that ball game, eight to nothing, and, and Waterville dominated play the rest of the ball game. I remember that as a cold day. Bit of wind up at Colby College. Uh, we had some great ball games that year. I can, there are two games that I really can recall. One at Westbrook. And Frankie Sears, in the beginning of the second half, got hurt, and Harry Harris stepped in and took over. Uh, he was a sophomore, and he certainly asserted his leadership abilities that day. And, and they just, he, was, he just became unstoppable. Uh, we were behind Chavis by two touchdowns, anyway. And, and Harry carried us, along with uh, McNabb, also a sophomore, came in and played well after some other backs after the Steve Fogg had been hurt. <laughs> really, we uh, had a whole stable of backs out there. We were really deep that year. And we ended up winning that ball game. And it was a game at home against Portland High, where Portland had a lead also. And uh, we came back a fourth period with. Uh, two or three touchdowns uh, to win that game. So we had some close ball games. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't win the big one. My fondest memories of playing for Thornton Academy aren't necessarily a specific game, a title, 
Uh, it's more of remembering the old field, playing in that venue. Uh, the current stadium they have now is beautiful, but it can't match in my mind the feeling we had when we ran onto that field. It was just a certain electricity in the air, and the fact that the bleachers were so close to the field and people would line up around the roped-in area, three and four deep, you could hear people screaming, the comments made, the, the noise at times seemed to be just unbelievable. And that's something that I carry on uh, as a, really a fond remembrance of what football used to be. And sometimes when I pass by the field and I look over there, it's, it's really a sad memory because I wish that the players of today could experience that feeling. Uh, and one other, one other, through all the games, and I tried to uh, remember what my fondest memory would be was a call made by then WID announcer Frankie DeFrancisco. We were playing Shevers <clears throat> my sophomore year, and the winner of that game would have the inside track to the state championship. It was nothing, nothing going into the fourth quarter, and Shevers quarterback dropped back. Uh, threw the ball just as he was hit, and I remember Frankie D saying, the ball is intercepted by Bartlett. It's intercepted by Bartlett! At the 30, at the 50, he's down to the 40, to 35, to 30, and he gets away from Bartlett to the 10, all the way, Dick Bartlett for the touchdown! All the excitement in his voice, although he was always very fair to both teams, uh, that was a very exciting moment for him. He was really proud of Thornton Academy that afternoon. I was fortunate enough to play in 1974, 75, and 76. We had three great football teams in, that, in those years. The 74 team went to the state championship. The 75 team, we had a lot of injuries, and that's where one of my most memorable games was in that 75 season. In November, Bitterford came across the river, bound for the state championship game. And that Trojan football team played like state champions that day. We beat Bitterford 21 to nothing with outstanding defense. Wayne Medora, Mark Lemlin in the middle linebacker slots were just killing people all day long. It all came together on offense. Scott Libby and Fred Pendleton in the backfield, Steve Fogg. We had a great day, and that was my junior year. And we felt after that game like we had won the state championship. It saved our season. We had some hard luck all season long. Then in 76, we had some hard luck in the preseason again. We lost our starting quarterback, and we struggled it a little bit early, but uh, one big key game in October of 76 is when Portland came down, highly favored, at a very large fullback by the name of Ed Bogdanovich and a big quarterback by the name of uh, David Littlefield. And everybody thought they were going to come down to soccer and take the day, but a fierce, militant defense out there just led the attack with a, a few ki uh, timely big plays. We controlled the ball on offense with Dan McLeod, Mike Hubert, Randy Hill running the football. We controlled that game, and we came out 16-8, the victor, and that was our best performance of that season because we did get banged up that day, but it was another state championship performance. And those two, those two games really stand out in my mind as the greatest, and I'm just, you take that with you for the rest of your life. When you think Thorne Academy's been playing football now for 100 years, it's quite special that I was able to be a part of it. I played in 77 and 78, and when I think back to my playing days, there's a couple of games that really stand out. My senior year, it was our homecoming against Sanford, and of course we played at the Old Field on Main Street. You had to cross the street to get over there. Sanford was coming down with one of the best running backs in the state, Tony Matoin. He did go on to win the Fitzy that year, and we knew we had to shut him down, and Sanford was uh, the most highly touted team at that time in the season. We had lost a couple of games early in the year that we never should have, so our fate was sealed already. There was no way we were going to the state with a single team playoff format that they had back then. So it was our goal to make our season to beat Sanford. And when we crossed the street that afternoon, it was a rainy, uh, wet day. And we had to wait for the fence to be opened up to get across the street and onto the field. And the whole team just started going crazy, beating on each other, screaming and hollering. And we were so fired up. The emotions were unbelievable. I'll never forget that, how we were just so possessed at playing football that day and couldn't wait to get on the field to take on Sanford. And when we did get on the field, our defense was phenomenal. We shut down Matoin. I think he only gained something like 52 yards on the afternoon. Um, the whole defense, uh, Royal Fournier, Jim Brunel, Carl Pecorero, we just all came together and really played an outstanding football game. We won 11-6 on that afternoon, and it was a great game of football for us and for our season. Stanford uh, 
went on to uh, come in second place because Deering won the states that year. And then, of course, when you play bitter for the last game of the year over at Waterhouse Field, uh, 7,500 fans. And that game, um, Chris Rosie was hurt, so I had to run back punts with Ken Hewitt. And uh, Coach Cody had us blocking the punt every time. So instead of sending Ken Hewitt back there, he put myself back there. Uh, by myself, and uh, I had to run back a lot of punts and take a lot of punishment on that afternoon because our defense did shut them out. And um, Bitterford really wanted me that day, and they were coming at me pretty hard. And uh, there was a lot of vicious hits and a lot of dirty stuff going on underneath the piles and things. But um, it was a fun afternoon. I'll never forget that. Uh, the Bitterford Thornton game and all the emotions that went into that. We won 14 to nothing and uh, finished up our year at 6 and 3. And, just glad to be part of Thornton Academy football now as a broadcaster and certainly back then as a player. The 80s saw a change in coaching from Bob Cody to Dick Agresti. It also saw two state championships in 1980. These kids won it all, Coach Dick Agresti pronounced at the start of the 1986 season. To prove them right, the team roared into the playoffs with eight straight wins and soundly whipped Bitterford 45 to 20 to win the Bowie Division. Advancing against South Portland, the speed and agility of Bobby Giroux and the dependable place kicking of Paul the Foot Tate, class of 87, led to a 21-12 win. TA then headed to the state title game against Bangor where the Trojans came out on top 28 to 6 for the first TA state title since 1962. Bob Giroux won the coveted Fitzpatrick Award and was elected to the All-American team. In 1988, after coming off an 8 and 1 season the previous year, the Trojans were ready to go all the way again in the playoffs. Putting a heartbreaking loss to Biddeford behind them, the Trojans looked to fall back Lance Lavoie, class of 89, and quarterback Chris Summer, class of 89, to lead them the victory. Both plays were among the top five rushes in the Western Class A Conference. Lavoie rushed 897 yards, Summer 689 yards. Facing Lawrence for the state championship, TA's offensive line consistently opened up holes for MVP Lance Lavoie, Chris Summer, and Mike Babcock to run through. Scott Newman, class of 89, and Dennis Steves, class of 90, hooked up with Summer for touchdown passes of 17 and 29 yards, respectively. With a decisive 47-13 win, TA became state champs for the second time in the decade. Overall, that team was ranked eighth in New England in a national sports news service poll, and they remain, for the time being, the last TA team to claim state champs. My senior year was 1980, and I consider myself very fortunate, not only because uh, I was with a, a group of outstanding football players, but also because uh, I was the, in the very first class to play in the new Dr. Paul S. Hill Stadium. Uh, the old football field was a great place to play football, and, and I have a lot of great memories from there. When I was growing up, I, I went to just about all of the Thorn Academy home football games, and, and it was a great place to watch football games, and it was a great place to play football games. But the new field brought uh, something else to Thornton Academy, and it's an ex exciting place to play football, and it's an ex exciting place to go and watch games. And I'm very happy that, that I was able to, to be there in that first season. Uh, we had a great season. We, we won our first seven games, and we went into our last game of the season against Biddeford. We were 7-0 and going into that game. Biddeford also was 7-0, and so there was a lot of excitement between the two uh, cities. And uh, unfortunately, we lost that game seven to nothing. Uh, Biddeford scored uh, on, you know, on a, on a long drive. They they got the ball after a after a, a penalty on a on a punt, and they got the ball back. Were able to bring it down uh, on a, on a long drive, and they punched it in on a on an option to the left. And it was just a tough way to lose a ball game. But you know, there were there were 7,500 people or so at that ball game. It was just a great game, but. But uh, I just remember so many things about that season. We had some great ball players on that team. Um, we were we were able to score at will in, in many of our games. We just had some had a great scoring uh, uh, group of of running backs, uh, such as Tommy Kane. I remember Tommy Kane in, in the Sanford game. It was they were a great team and. Uh, uh, early in the game, Tom got the ball on, an, on, a, uh, on a counter up the middle, and he just broke it open, and I'm going to say he ran 60, maybe 70 yards and scored a touchdown. It was just an exciting uh, play, and, 
and there were other great players on that team. Danny Labby used to uh, run bellies to the left and bellies to the right, and that set up the option for us. Uh, uh, John Fogg would run the option uh, on the outside. He'd get that ball, and he'd, he'd go like crazy. He just had some outstanding plays. He would score, uh, you know, 40 and 50-yard runs all the time. Of course, you can't do that with a, without the help of, a, of an outstanding line. We had guys like uh, co-captain Bobby Vance was in the line, Joel Tripp, Donald Tebow, Bill Mitchell was, was a left tackle on, uh, in, in that year. Um, so we just had an outstanding offense. We had some. We had a great defense. They just would go crazy when 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 you really needed them. You you could count on them. Guys like Donald Maycumber was playing in, and David Pendleton, Mike Gallant was a middle linebacker. Danny Jamison was a safety. These were just outstanding ball players, and and I'm glad I was able to play with them, and uh, and I'm just excited that I could be part of the Thornton Academy tradition. I played the 1982 season against Biddeford, and we went into the game being 6-1, and one, them being 5-2. and two. They had to win the game to make it to the playoffs. Whether we won or lost, we were at the playoffs anyway. We started out uh, the first quarter, and we had a halfback option pass. I remember Pete Snow throwing it to uh, Tommy Fordia, who made a great tip over the halfback and catching it. That was about a 55-yard play. That really uh, put the fans down on the benefit side and got the Thornton fans really uh, motivated because uh, we were actually underdogs going into the game. Towards the end of the game, we had about two minutes left. Benefit was beating us 14 to 12. We were on our own five-yard line. All the fans on the uh, benefit side, even our side, were walking out. We drove the ball from our own five-yard line down to their five-yard line. I had a pass to Timmy Carey, brought us up to about the 40-yard line. Another pass to Jameson, brought us down to the 18. Passed it to Jameson again, made a really nice catch, and brought us down to the 5. Pete Snow ran it in. That was a real memorable game. We went on to, to the playoffs to play against Portland. We lost, but I'll never regret ever playing football for Thornton. And that bit of the game was a very good experience. I'll never forget it. Well, I think what, what stands out is just being in a state championship game. And uh, obviously the, the first one you, you win is always a special one because you always uh, achieve to get there, but you never know if you're actually going to, to fulfill that achievement or dream. Uh, so that first one is, is special. Uh, uh, I, what pleased me about that particular team is that the previous year, um, a lot of those kids were were junior players, and they they really worked in the off season and came through. And there were there were so many of them that you know that were so-called uh, heroes or stars of the entire season. Uh, there really wasn't uh, much pressure put on one individual person. It was the, the pressure was dispersed. You know, one game. Uh, uh, a John Gus would come through the next game, a Bob Giroux the next game, a Craig Tebow would have a great game, uh, uh, you know, the quarterback, it was David Robinson, and he had a great year. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think in looking back at that first state championship in retrospect, it, that's what pleases me is how uh, you always, you know, preach a team concept, and, and that was very evident with that group of kids. I played for the 86 championship team, um, which went, I think it was 10 and 0, undefeated state champs. Um, biggest play for myself would have to be uh, fourth game of the season. Uh, came back, just, just started playing again after an injury. We were tied at 7 7 with South Portland. Uh, crucial point in the game. We had just had a terrific run by John Susie called back. Uh, play came in from the sidelines. Just a Playing old fade, I was surprised. I think David was surprised too. Uh, I looked up field, saw it was open. David threw a perfect ball right down the sidelines. About, I don't know, 50, 60 yards, right on the money, right over the shoulder, and for a touchdown. Uh, broke it. Broke the tie and we went on to win 20, 2014. Big turning point for us. Um, big games have to be good for TA. Uh, biggest game for me, biggest game I've ever played in, most people I've ever seen in the game. Uh, it was an excellent game, <clears throat> right up until the half, 7-6 at the half, we were down actually, came back to win 45-20. Uh, second half, I think it was a first, first series, Chris Summers picked up a nice ball and went down to about the two, 
I might come in, we just went hog wild on. I I had uh, probably uh, what I had <laughs> two touchdowns and more receiving yards than David had thrown, so he wasn't too too happy about that. Uh, he had one pass caught behind my scrimmage and tackled for a loss, so he thought it was a mistake in the paper, but we corrected it. Uh, definitely the biggest thrill playing in front of that many people. Uh, you catch a ball, and even if people are screaming at you from the wrong side or the right side, you're still making the same amount of noise, and it's really incredible. I have to say nothing will, uh, nothing will come close to that. It's unbelievable. The whole team is just, there's no sophomores, there's no juniors, there's nobody. We're all just one team. It's unbelievable. Everybody respects everybody else. Everybody just one unit. We play together. Never look down. We never look down, never look back or anything like that. We're just number one. I think John speaks for the rest of the team because it's hard to get 40-something players on each talk at once. Uh, you made some key plays this afternoon. Did you notice that they were maybe king on you a little more? I love that because it opens, opens everything else up. I'll do anything for the team. I know anybody else would. I don't care as long as we win. I played on the uh, 1988 team. Uh, we won 11-1. We ended up going to the state championship game, playing Lawrence up there. Um, we had a tough road through the playoffs to get there. Uh, we had to beat South Portland up there. Um, we, we, and then we had to go to, go to uh, Lewiston and play up there, and we had to come from behind. I didn't really play that well. I threw six interceptions, but Lance and Roy had a real good game. And we won with like four, four minutes left in the game or something like that. And it was, it was, it was a great game. And then we played up, up at Bowdoin against Lawrence. Um, we started kind of auspiciously. Uh, we, we kicked off the Kurt Matthew, who's now probably the top back in the state as far as college. Um, and he ran it back for a touchdown. And uh, we were kind of like, uh-oh, I think we might be in a little bit of trouble here. But we regrouped. Um, Lance ran for over 200 yards, had I think five touchdowns. Um, I had, a, you know, I, I had a, a real good game. Uh, every, you know, our defense held, as I said, the top back in the state to like I think 42 yards or something like that the whole game. Besides his, 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 his the, the first time he touched the ball, um, and. We really smacked them, and we, we beat them 45-13, and uh, it was just, it was, it was, it was great. It, it's a, throwing the academy football is a big part of my life, and it was a, it was a real great time in my life to, to, to be able to do that. Although the 90s are still young, the first three seasons have been more than worthy of the TA legend. The Thornton Trojans have made three consecutive appearances in the playoffs and a new all-time scoring record has been set with the play of Art Laveras, not to mention his 3,649 yards rushing and his Fitzpatrick Trophy. Hot-stopping moments have excited fans throughout these first three seasons, particularly the last play victory over Biddeford in 1991. I would have to say the best memory of Thornton football for me is my junior year when we played Biddeford for the first time. Uh, there was just an incredible crowd there. It was a great rivalry. Uh, there were great plays, great players, and a fantastic finish. And I, I guess that's all you can ask from a bit of important game. Uh, I remember we were losing last minutes of the game, and we came out on the line, and uh, I called a play, and Troy Karen didn't really know what the play was. So I had to tell him on the line. And then we proceeded to run the play and he caught a, he caught the pass on the one yard line and bowled his way in for the for the touchdown. And the extra point put us into overtime. In overtime, we put the ball in, you know, Adi Laveras ran the ball in on the second play, I think it was. And, you know, our defense just came up big when they had the ball you know, popped the fumble, and we picked it up, and we won the game. What I remember, I guess, is the pressure and the excitement and just the feeling that there were so many great players around, like Troy Karen, and 
I guess especially out with this. Getting to play football for Thorne Academy was very special in my life, but being a broadcaster for the past five years has been equally so. And over those five years, I've gotten to call every single touchdown run by Fitzpatrick winner Art Laveris, one of the best backs to ever play in the state of Maine. And his play was just amazing week after week to see him run with the football was really fun. And I'll always have those memories wherever I go. And then you think back to that one brilliant game in the fall of 1991, Thornton Bitterford, the last game of the year in the rivalry, rich in tradition. And that game went right down to the wire. And as I remember back to that final minute 19, I get dizzy thinking about it. Ahead of Thorn Academy. Hervis back to pass. This time he's got time. Fires it downfield. LeBlanc's out there. Up and a circus catch! Wow! LeBlanc has it at the 19! How can it be? They're going to give themselves another play. 11 seconds on the clock! Wow. Matt LeBlanc up in the air, ahead of the defense of the Tigers. They get the first down. And... Coach Agresti out now with the offense. They're at the 20. They may have time enough for two tries. They got to be quick plays. I believe that was Thornton Academy's last time out. So I he think you're right. So, yeah. He, <laughs> he has to make sure to instruct Purvis. If you feel the heat, you've got to get rid of the football someplace safe so we can run another play. Exactly. A, a sack and this ball game's over. And if they throw over the middle and it doesn't get in the end zone, it could be over, too. Well, we would expect right now. Unless the only thing that they could hope for, Mark, if they throw over the middle at about the 10-yard, get the first down, clock would have to stop to move the chains, and then maybe you get up at the line of scrimmage and stop the clock quickly right. with an out, a quick out pass. Well, those receivers have to make sure that they clear beyond the 10-yard line. I would have liked to see Thorne in that situation right there. The chains have to go a long way down the sideline. Now think about this. A long way down the sideline. You got the completion. Get your team up to the line of scrimmage. You're waiting for the chains to move 30 yards. You get the ball. You throw the quick out. You stop the clock. You maybe lose two seconds off the clock. And then you still got one timeout left with nine seconds to go and still a chance for two plays. That, that is a, a definite uh, scenario that could have happened. Thorne Academy. With a chance still, LeBlanc, outstanding catch. Purvis got it in the vicinity. First and 10, ball at the 20, 11 seconds left. Purvis back to pass, he's got some time, fires it off oh. of LeBlanc, LeBlanc diving inside. Incomplete, six seconds, another chance. LeBlanc, almost another great catch. He had a chance, he stopped and dove back in for it. When that football was first thrown, I didn't think LeBlanc had any chance of catching that ball. All I saw was a Biddeford Tiger defender in the end zone, but somehow Matt LeBlanc got close to that ball and almost coming up with a this is it. to catch. This is it. Six seconds. 78th battle of the bridge. It's all come down to this. Lasur to the near side. LeBlanc to the far. Purvis got tied. Fires over the middle. Troy Karen's there. Does he get in? Yes! saying about Troy Karen all year got to use the size to his advantage plowing through the end zone that time Jay I'll tell you this he was not to be denied look like some movement from the the field. Field. yes sir We have just witnessed one of the most outstanding high school football games ever played. Throughout the years, there have been so many great Thornton St. Louis games, TA Biddeford matchups, but that one in 1991, probably the best. I'm glad to have been a part of that contest, and I know the Thornton Biddeford rivalry continues to grow. I'm proud that Thornton has such a rich football tradition, and it continues to prosper in its 100th year. The first 100 years of football at Thornton Academy are a wonderful legacy. They have created memories that are cherished by all of us, fans and players alike. No matter how many years have passed since we left the halls of old TA, may the autumn days of the next 100 years provide as many cheering crowds 
brilliant plays, thrilling moments, and lifelong friendships.